Uh, yeah, so as I was introduced, I'm Jeff Wagner. I'm technical lead at Open Force Field. Uh, the original speaker for this slot was Lily Wang, our science lead, but she couldn't make it. She's uh, down under in Australia. Uh, so I'm taking her place today. Um, I'll be your s silver medal. So we're Open Force Field. Let's start with what is a force field? The government has been hiding information from you about a supernatural phenomenon. No. A force field is what you use in an atomistic simulation. It's a lot like an electric field. So you've all seen these electric field uh, diagrams where you've got some sort of probe, like a, a thing with a unit charge. And this field diagram shows you what force that unit charge would be feeling wherever you put it. Uh, a force field in the context of atomistic simulations is basically the same thing. But instead of just a point charge floating around in an electric field, you've got an atom involved in maybe a molecule feeling forces from all of the different interactions that it's having. We use simplified models. So if you wanted to get a really accurate look of uh, what forces an atom is feeling, uh, you would want to use like a QM calculation. But QM calculations, quantum mechanics calculations, are too expensive to be of use for something like a pharmaceutical context, where you need to see what a protein is doing over the scale of micro or milliseconds. So instead, we have a simplified potential. And the potential that we use, uh, basically, we have, uh, starting from the bottom, we have electrostatics, like you'd see with an electric field. That's just the Coulomb equation. Uh, atoms are involved in these more complex molecular topologies. And so we model the bonds that they're involved in as like harmonic. The angles are also harmonic. That's kind of made up. Uh, the dihedrals are sort of a fudge factor that we put on there. And then we have a model for the sterics. And this is there's a number of alternatives here, but we use this Leonard Jones 12-6 form where basically if two atoms get too close, they feel a steric repulsion. But then if they're sort of a medium distance away from each other, they're feeling this, let's call it induced dipole, um, kind of pull towards each other. And the exact strength of those uh, tells, tells you a lot about what your simulation is going to be doing. And it helps you differentiate between different kind of atoms that could be interacting. So in the context I'm going to be talking about today, a force field is something that brings you from a molecular topology like we have on the left to a simulation where things are applying forces to each other and wiggling around at a certain temperature like we see on the right. So that's what a force field is. What is an open force field consortium? Open force field, roughly speaking, has two parts. We have a consortium, which is industry funded, and we have an initiative, which is uh, government and grant funded. So we have a number of industry partners in the pharmaceutical, uh, crop science, and material science spaces. And they pay into uh, the Open Molecular Software Foundation, which is like the umbrella nonprofit that hosts our project and Open Free Energy and some others. Uh, and within Open Force Field, I'm the technical lead, and Lily Wang, who can't be here today as a science lead, we lead the, the infrastructure and force field teams, respectively. We interact closely with four academic labs, uh, the Codera Lab, the Gilson Lab, the Mobley Lab, and the Schertz Lab. And they are getting uh, grants from the NIH and NSF. And their grad students and postdocs are doing research to improve the accuracy of force field and look at different applications. Um, but basically, by working together, we can make the tools that help enable this sort of experimentation. And then they can go and, and do their thesis and write papers on ways to improve the accuracy. And once those improvements are proven and we find that they have like competitive performance, we can fold those back into the flagship products that we're shipping to, to industry users. Pharmaceutical and material sciences are interesting places to have this sort of consortium because these are extremely competitive like intellectually, intellectual property fields. You don't want other people guessing at what disease you're looking at or what chemical matter you're starting to build. And so the way that we've structured it is that we are strictly in this pre-competitive space. So our, uh, our models are agnostic to which disease you're studying. We handle all small molecules as long as they're like roughly organic looking. Um, and so in this pre-competitive space, we release Python toolkits. We have the data sets that we use to train our models, that we use to train our force fields. We have open infrastructure that anybody can use. And we're really open with our science. So most of our meetings are open if anybody wants to come. We upload all of our talks to Zenodo and YouTube. Um, we're, we're very open with our data if people want to come get it. And so this whole effort started almost five years ago. Uh, in October 2018 was when we got like our critical mass of funding from these pharma companies. And that's when I was hired. And that's when the team started. Uh, and so in mid-2019, we released our first retrained force field. This was called Parsley, uh, or OpenFF 1.0.0. In the coming months and years, we released OpenFF 1.2.0, 1.3.0. Uh, and then 
late in 2021, I think, we released Sage, and where the Parsley series was refitting just the terms for bonds, angles, and torsions, because uh, you can do that just to QM data. The Sage release also refit the non-bonded, the Leonard Jones terms. And to do that, you can just use QM. So for, for refitting bonds and angles, you can kind of stretch them and do QM calculations and see how much they want to go back to equilibrium, get pretty good terms. But for non-bonded terms, it's a lot more complicated. We actually had to get these detailed measurements of mixtures, which we might hear about in the NIST talk, uh, you know, where they, they take two organic solvents and they mix them together and they measure the density to like five significant figures. And we would do simulations and kind of iteratively try to tune our parameters to reproduce these known physical uh, measurements. So just a few months ago, we released Sage 2.1.0, which fixes some deficiencies that our partners had pointed out with uh, Sage 2.0. And our next release, uh, and this is going to be sort of approximate, our next release is going to be Rosemary. And that's going to be a single force field that handles both small molecules and proteins. And this is important because people right now sort of have to mix and match. You pick your protein force field, you pick your small molecule force field. All these permutations will give you different numbers, but some of them are more correct and we're just not sure. Uh, by training a protein and small molecule force field into one single model, we're hoping that we can get a self-consistent model, like a self-consistent force field that gives accurate results. Following that, we're hoping to release uh, a point release of Rosemary, maybe Rosemary 3.1, where we switch from a uh, a charge model that requires semi-empirical QM calculations to one that's just got charge assigned, charges assigned by QM. And then eventually we're going to release time, which will be a uh, force field that doesn't just have atom-centered point charges, but also includes virtual sites to capture like electrostatic uh, anisotropy around polarizable atoms. Okay, so there's theory. Let's talk about cool stuff. I, I was really excited seeing some of the talks this morning because they were like pulling up code and showing things actually running, and that's what I'm really excited about. So what I'm going to show you on the next few slides are called our vignettes, and it's like when you go to the Lego store and you're going to get some Legos, they don't try to sell it to you by like taking one Lego out of each bucket and trying to sell you the individual Legos. They show you that you can make a cool house or a pirate ship. And then you say, oh, wow, OK, now I'm interested myself in figuring out what these Legos are. So I'm not going to try to sell you our whole ecosystem package by package. I'm going to show you some stuff that it can do, and then hopefully you'll want to use it. Here's a QR code that won't be very useful, because your phone probably doesn't run Colab very well. But if you go to this URL, which I also posted in the Slack channel, you can run these along with me. We've got a traffic light system for how production ready these are. Green means Go for it. This should run on your computer. You should be able to put in your own inputs and, and model your own molecules. Down to red, which means this stuff's a prototype. It may be production ready in a few months. So as a basic example of what it looks like to use open force field, here's uh, sort of a minimal, minimal case where we set up a protein ligand simulation in a box of water and salt. Uh, starting at the top, we import a few modules. We import a detailed chemical description of the small molecule ligand that's docked in this protein. So if you look in the protein, there's that little gray guy in the middle. That's a small molecule ligand. Uh, we load a detailed description of it in this pt2385.sdf file, and that contains the bond orders, the formal charges, the actual chemistry of the ligand. Then in the next step, we load this whole solvated box. And the open force field toolkit already knows what water looks like. It knows what sodium and chloride look like, the purple and the green guys. And it knows the, the canonical amino acid, so it can load that protein. But there's one unfamiliar component in there, which is a small molecule that isn't you know, a standardized thing that you find in every protein. There's a bajillion different small molecules. So we have to additionally tell it that we're going to find this unique small molecule. And as the loader goes through the components in the system, it's going to find one that has this element graph that matches up with this ligand that we just loaded. And it will be able to load this whole topology into a form where we can assign parameters to it. Next, we construct a force field object. And uh, we have a special force field format that I'm not going to get into, but it lets you basically append force fields to each other. So you can have this hierarchy where uh, terms from one force field, the first one that you load, can be overridden by terms from the second force field that you load. And in this case, we load first our small molecule force field, which knows how to parameterize water, ions, and the small molecule ligand. And then we load the protein force field, which recognizes entire amino acids only if they're complete. This protein force field then applies to the protein, the, the red wiggly ribbon guy, and Sage applies to everything else, and we get our simulation. This takes all of seven lines of OpenFF code, and then after that, it's all sort of OpenMM boilerplate to set up the, the 
thermostat and the reporters and everything. So that's an exact example. Abstracting a little bit, here's what our ecosystem looks like. Uh, all, of the, all of the colored boxes here are OpenFF ecosystem products, and the gray boxes are external, external things. We start up on the top left, where you can load chemical structures from a variety of formats, including SMILES, PDB, and SDF. Um, and when you load those in, you turn those into a OpenFF topology object, and that's just basically a collection of molecules that may or may not have coordinates yet. Uh, and then you make a force field object by loading an OFF XML file. And I'll talk in a little bit about what happens if you want to get improved uh, parameters for your specific molecule. You can use this bespoke fit package, but that will just make an OFF XML file that you load into a force field. Once you have a topology and a force field, uh, you tell them to kiss and you get an interchange object. And interchange is our simulation ecosystem agnostic parameterized molecule container. So it contains basically all the physics parameters for uh, your, your box of molecules, and it can export it to a variety of different MD engines. Our primary export is OpenMM, but we're also implementing support for Amber and Gromax, works pretty well for standard cases, and we're looking at a few others. To enable uh, force field research, we have a plugin ecosystem, so people can put in custom functional forms or they can replace part of the functional form with, with something that they're experimenting with, and we have a plugin interface for both the force field class and interchange, an interchange can also load a like, limited number of externally parameterized components. So if you parameterize something in Amber or using FOIA or something like that, uh, there's kind of a medium chance that interchange can import that and combine it with Smirnoff uh, parameterized components. So one neat thing that you can do, because we, we don't need atom-type representations of molecules, we just take the straight chemistry, is that we can talk directly to our DKIT, which is a popular cheminformatics toolkit in our field. And we can, uh, our DKIT can go ahead and model like a reaction. So here, here's the simulation that I showed you before. Here's the input ligand, and here's a simulation that comes out with that ligand. I can take the exact same input and just apply this our DKIT reaction where I'm saying go find an aliphatic carbon hydrogen bond and turn it into a carbon fluorine bond. Just replace that hydrogen with a fluorine. I'll get a new molecular graph. And in any other simulation ecosystem, it would be a real pain to go and modify your input molecule and then try to, try to simulate it. It would break the atom typing, it would be a big disaster. But because open force field operates directly using the chemical structure of the input, I can go and take all of the possible outputs from applying this reaction once. Uh, so here on the chemical structures, I've circled in each one where the fluorine's been substituted for a hydrogen. And each of these is trivially easy to send to a simulation, and so it's a little bit harder to see, but in each of these simulations, I've highlighted where that Hydrogen has become a fluorine. And this entire thing runs in about 70 lines of code um, in, in about 10 minutes. And so if you're interested in seeing this with your own eyes, uh, there's that vignettes website that I talked about. Uh, this one's called RDKit Ligand Modification. Uh, and you can go and check out all the code that you need to do this. There's some, chemical space is big. Like if you take all the reasonable organic molecules you could make with like 30 heavy atoms and just enumerate them, you'd have more of those than you would have particles in the universe. Like, our force field has to be general in order to encompass all the possible chemistries that might come walking in the front door. And so that means we do badly on some chemistries. And for that reason, we made this tool called BespokeFit. So here on the right, we have a, an input molecule that looks pretty reasonable. But if we try to compare how SAGE would parameterize it to how QM says the energy of a torsion should be, it looks pretty garbage. So we've highlighted torsion here with these four atoms, and we're doing a dihedral scan of it. So we're just kind of rotating it around and seeing what the mo molecule's energies look like. In red is what it looks like originally with the SAGE force field. In blue is what the QM says that the energy profile should be. And they look nothing like each other. Like the minima aren't even in the right place. Like your simulation is going to be garbage with this. With bespoke fit, though, it can go and take an input molecule like this, chunk it up, do rotations about these torsions, and then refit the terms that Sage would have applied and put in new torsion terms that will apply when that molecule comes in as a real input. And so what we see here in green is the bespoke fit derived torsion profile, which looks very closely in agreement with the QM. Bespoke fit's really clever. When you give it a big molecule, it says, wow, this thing has a lot of torsions, and if I were to take this whole molecule and do rotations about each one of these torsions, this is gonna take me an eon to finish, because QM is expensive. So it knows how to chunk down the molecule into electronically decoupled fragments, and then it just does the torsion drives on those fragments. So here's a single input molecule 
showing what the fragments would be when it gets chunked out, and then highlighting the torsions that would be driven in each one. And using it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's accessed primarily via the command line. And so uh, here I've got the little sneaky exclamation point in my Jupyter notebook. This is going off and running bespoke fit on the command line. It's outputting a new force field file, OpenFF 2.0.0, with some stuff at the end. And that's exactly corresponding to the contents. It's just got a few extra torsion terms at the end that will match only to this molecule. Using bespoke fit in the previous example, just the beginning would change a little bit. We would execute this on the command line. It would go take a few minutes, maybe an hour. Uh, and then we would load up the new force field that contains all of the sage terms and additionally the new torsion terms for the molecule of interest. I told you that interchange is a simulation ecosystem agnostic parameter container. And here's an example of that. Uh, we have a vignette for this. This is the interchange Gromax export vignette. But here I've taken a box of random organic compounds and simulated them. On the left, I use interchange to export them to OpenMM, and we get a good looking simulation. On the right, I export them to Gromax. We get a good looking simulation. Uh, the reason they look different is because I'm bad with FFmpeg, and I, it, it was hard to get things small enough to fit on here. But they're really, if I, if I stagger their time steps evenly, you'd see that they're about the same temperature and, th and they're doing the same physics. For a more relevant simulation, here's all the code that you need to set up a uh, MyCell self-assembly simulation. And what's cool about this is this doesn't even begin with coordinates. Like that first thing we saw was a box where all the waters had already been placed. But here we're just using the PacMole tool and starting with a bunch of smiles codes. So we've got smiles of the MyCell. We've got the smiles of water. And then we just tell PacMole, like, I want 4,000 waters and 20 of these lipids, 25 of these lipids arranges them evenly throughout the box, simulate, and you get this micelle formation. All the hydrophobic tails of these fatty acids are all coming together, and then the, the hydrophilic heads are, uh, are sticking to out on the outside. And this one's not much to look at, because it looks exactly like a normal simulation. But I had mentioned before that interchange in the force field class can take uh, custom plugins. So you can modify, in this case, the Leonard Jones functional form is being substituted with a double exponential functional form. Uh, it's all going to be messy, but here's, here's a monster with a bunch of exponentials. And that's the actual non-bonded force being used here. But it can use our normal force field Smirnoff typing rules uh, just transparently. Just drop out the van der Waals, put this in. And here we don't have a vignette because this is just a published paper. If you want to see the details of this, you can just head over to the uh, DE force fields repository uh, on GitHub uh, that accompanies the paper that came out. And so one tough thing is to fit our MM force fields, we have to do a lot of, uh, we have to work with large amounts of QM data. And I told you earlier that when we load a molecule into MM land, into Smirnoff land, we need the input file to tell us where the double bonds are. We need to know where the formal charges are. And in QM land, molecules have a very different definition. QM land says, tell me where the nuclei are and tell me how many electrons there are total. And then don't tell me anything else because it's my job to figure out where those electrons go. And so it's a little bit tough. Like, we can't have data sets easily jumping back and forth between MM land and QM land, but that's exactly what we need to have happen when we're benchmarking and fitting these force fields. So for that, we have this tool called QC Submit. And QC Submit is made to talk directly to the MULSI QC archive, uh, which is basically the global QC fractal server, uh, which contains tons and tons of QM data. Most of it is, I believe, ours, because we make a ton of it. And this is a really handy tool that lets you just go in, pull down this stuff, and then plug it into a molecular mechanics tool so that you can do benchmarking or fitting or comparison or what have you. So in all the examples that I've shown you so far, when I've loaded multiple force fields, each force field has fully applied to one molecule. And that doesn't have to be the case. Our Smirnoff typing rules that we use at Open Force Field just look for chemical substructures, and it doesn't care what the atom names are or anything. It just cares about the chemistry. And that means that we can actually blend force field files together. And so in this case, this is a simulation of a modified amino or a modified peptide. This is five alanines followed by a cysteine followed by five alanines. But the cysteine has been covalently modified with this fluorophore that's bound to it. And what I'm showing here in yellow, this is all the original protein. And in green, this is a fluorophore that got covalently attached to the cysteine. And this would be a massive pain to simulate anywhere else. Like, I don't know if people have done modified protein simulations, but this would just be like super hard to do with an atom type force field. 
But what we do is we say, okay, let's load the protein force field and we'll have that apply to anything that looks entirely like an amino acid. Because protein force fields are tailor-made, they do a really good job describing the chemistry of, of the 20 canonical amino acids. And then for anything that's not recognized, let's use a small molecule force field, let's use SAGE. And so in yellow, these are actually bonds that are assigned by our port of AMBER's FF14SB. And in green, these are bonds assigned by the SAGE force field. And there's a little bit of trickery we have to do here to get the partial charges right, but we can actually turn this into a simulation. And here we have a whole video, we have a workshop and notebooks pointing you at how to do this. And if you look at the uh, non-canonical amino acid parameterization vignette, uh, that'll send you the link to, to find all of that. So one of our big limitations right now is that to assign partial charges, we have to do uh, these semi-empirical QM calculations, and those are expensive. They scale as like n cubed with a number of electrons. So like, once you get too many atoms, it becomes awful. And to avoid that scaling, uh, so that we can model larger molecules easily, we're moving to a neural network charge model. So we're training it on a bunch of small molecules that we can actually run semi-empirical QM on, but then once the neural network is trained, we expect it to perform uh, well, basically scaling as just with the number of atoms linearly for large molecules. So that'll be super exciting. This is a prototype that you can try out in our red vignette, um, but we're hoping that we can get this released later this year, and that should massively expand the scope of things that we can simulate. And we have this tool called OpenFF Recharge, which is an interface for us to play with electrostatics, especially in the fitting and benchmarking process. And so here we have an anisotropy. This is a methyl bromide molecule. There's a carbon in the back in gray, and there's a bromine in the front in red. And it's got this sigma hole in the electrostatic potential. And if we just use point-centered charges, we can't model that sigma hole. But if we insert this virtual site, this off-nuclear, like this off-center charge uh, with an opposite charge, uh, we can take some of the charge from the bromine nucleus and we can put it out here. And then the electrostatic potential that the other nearby molecules see becomes a lot more accurate for predicting interactions. So those are a few things. I hope you're excited about what we can do in our ecosystem. And we put a lot of work in this last year into our documentation to help people jumping in. So in the middle, I'm showing our wayfinding docs. If you go to docs.openforcefield.org, this shows you a view of our normal workflow. And Actually, these boxes have links to the individual packages in the API docs for our classes. So if you say, oh, I want to know how to make a molecule, or oh, I want to go modify a force field, you can click right through on this top level wayfinding docs page. Also, just last week, we've uh, aggregated all of the examples from our different uh, repositories, and we have them presented on one front page for all of our examples. We've got tutorials in a top section, then we have um, advanced examples down below. And many of our docs have uh, theory pages as well. So this is the theory page from Bespoke Fit. Uh, yeah, in the coming year, we're hoping to improve infrastructure usability a lot. Right now, our protein force field application is a little bit slow. It, we're a little bit restricted in what we can load just before we apply parameters, just what we can get into like a Kekulé structure suitable for parameter assignment. And so we're doing some work to load more general polymers and um, become more useful for protein ligand workflows, because I think that's what a lot of our pharma partners really want. They want to be able to model modified proteins more easily and stuff like that, and load different file formats. So to reiterate, our next major releases, uh, we're going to have a self-consistent small molecule and protein force field in probably a force field called Rosemary. We're going to have graph charges in uh, Rosemary 3.1, like a point release, and that should make charge assignment a lot faster and more extensible and we'll be adding virtual sites. So if you're interested, I wanted to pitch, uh, we have a sister project that is sort of modeled after us uh, called Open Free Energy. They're young, but they're moving really fast. Free energy calculations are what you do once you've got the molecules parameterized to predict the binding affinity with a protein. I'd encourage you to look into Open Free Energy if you have time. If anyone here is interested in partnering with Open Force Field, we love industry partners. We'll give you direct access to uh, developers. You get to be on the ad board. Feel free to talk to me or contact info at openforcefield.org. And I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much, everyone, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, you, Jeff, for staying perfectly in time. Uh, are there any questions in the, in the room? Yeah, Mikhail, oh, there's one. 
Hi, Jeff. Thanks a lot for this nice overview. So I was wondering, you talk a lot about the need to develop bespoke parameters and everything, uh, but I was wondering, do you already have or do you plan to develop tools that allow people to, for instance, retrain force fields and then also check whether, you know, check back with, um, for instance, after you run an MD calculation, check whether the, the population of your molecule, the dihedrals, actually fit with the QM potentially you developed uh, using bespoke fit? Yeah, so I think the question is basically, how can you be sure that bespoke fit did a good job? Because maybe in some cases it only sees a fragment of the molecule, or you know maybe there's some difference between what bespoke fit fit and what's actually going to be simulated. And the answer is that um, bespoke fit actually uses the same charges, the same non-bonded terms and everything as the force field that it's being fit to. Uh, so it should all be identical, uh, but if there's any doubt, bespoke fit actually prints out graphs of how the new terms um, have uh, perform against the QM that it tried to fit to. Because sometimes you just don't have enough torsion terms or for different reasons you can't fit the QM surface. Um, but there's graphs that bespoke fit will make that you can check out. And if the profiles look totally different, you know that it's going to be bunk. Cheers. Uh, Daniel, do you have any questions from the, from the internet? What, uh, what, uh, you, you notice you're using units? Yeah. What are you using? What, what, oh, we're using Pint. Um, I, I was going to put in a slide this morning. I saw the, the birdsong talk use Pint. Um, and I got really excited that people were talking about their dependencies, but I didn't end up making the slide. <laughs> yes. I think there's a question. Any other questions? Yep. Hi, thanks. Great presentation. Um, yeah, it's sort of related to the bespoke and then your plans to uh, move to like neural network for um, charge fitting for larger molecules. So um, I was just wondering if you could comment on training on purely small molecules and then trying to use something like a neural network. Um, what kind of, how you expect to do, to do, I guess, or what people are doing in the literature. I'm thinking of like when you put together small constituent parts, there's all these charge transfer effects, things get really hard and messy, and we kind of have a giant unknown with the neural network as to the answer you get out. So just curious about your comments, thanks. Yeah, it's a really good question. So basically, right, there's no guarantee. So you could, you could fit your neural network to charges assigned for small molecules and then see if they scale up to medium. And then you could do like, you could have part of your data set be medium molecules and say, oh, did it do well? But you're right, as you get larger and larger molecules, they can like self-polarize and like get all messy such that what works on a small molecule might not work on a large molecule. And at this stage, we're, you know, the, what I would say to that is when you look at how protein force fields, which are actually, you know, doing really well right now, when you look at how protein force fields do their charges, their library charges just for amino acids, irregardless of context, uh, you know, like what's upstream, what's downstream, and they, in nature, they do polarize each other, but these point, you know, these fixed charges that are only based on the locality of just the amino acid are good enough. Um, so it could be that in molecules that have long conjugated systems or something that you can have really long distance charge transfer that a neural network would fail. Um, but I think that's a pretty rare case, and I guess we'll, we'll just have to look for it. I think we can do one or two more questions if there are any more in the room. Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, just curious what your thoughts on applying this type of framework to other materials, inorganic molecules, maybe metals and oxides? Yeah, I would be pretty optimistic about it. Um, I skipped a slide on exactly here, I'll, I'll just pop it up real fast. I talk about our special force field format, but I never actually explained what it is because it takes too long to explain. But what we do in our special force field format is we look for exact substructure matches to these calculate structures. And in organic space, I think it's pretty easy because everything can be represented in like single bond, double bond, like it doesn't get too bad. But once you get metals, I think you get weird stuff. You get like date of bonds and stuff. and I, I don't think there would be any inherent problem with the concept of it, but I just think the infrastructure may have a tough time of getting valid representations of these molecules, like organic mo uh, metal molecules and, and frameworks. Uh, and the parameter application may have a tough time, like coming up with rules for like what's a single bond, double bond, 
Um, but inherently, I don't see a problem with it. Like, you should be able to assign parameters, and, and probably most stuff would be well behaved. Related to the question, I was wondering so you mentioned in terms of uh, 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 you have Gromax, you have Amber. Uh, would it make any sense to export to LAMPS, for example, or is that kind of out of the question? Oh, yeah, sense? I think we yeah. do export to LAMPS. I forgot that we had material scientists in this room. Yeah, I think our, our LAMPS export is, is pretty much active right now. Um, right. I, I think that's a great start. <laughs> any, any last question? Uh, last question? If not, then uh, let's thank our speaker again. And, uh, yep.